As she came to the tomb upon which she placed her hand, she bent over to look in and hurried away. John, in flowing robe, appeared, looking at the tomb. Then came Peter, who entered the tomb, followed slowly by John. As they departed, Mary reappeared, leaning her head upon her arm at the tomb. She wept. Turning herself, she saw Jesus standing. So did I. I knew it was he. She knelt before him with arms outstretched and looking into his face, cried, Rabboni. I awakened, gripping the Bible, with muscles tense and nerves vibrating. Under the inspiration of this vision, I wrote as quickly as I could, as the worm's words could be formed into the poem, exactly as it has appeared that same evening I wrote that music. And that was Austin Mills' account of how he wrote this beautiful hymn that we're going to sing this morning. Please join with me in prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we come before you. We are honored. We are excited to be in the house of God, before the throne of God. We are grateful, O oh Lord, that you have opened up this relationship with you, that we might come before you justified by faith. We who are sinners, who are turning away from our sin and pursuing the path of righteousness for your name's sake. We ask, O oh Lord, that as we come together, as we are together, to, to be in worship of you, that you open our hearts and minds you allow us to feel your presence and to understand your way through us, through your holy word. We ask that you would so work in our lives by the outpouring of your Holy Spirit that even the person of Jesus Christ would be in our hearts. For Jesus told us, I stand at the door and knock, and who, whoever should open the door and let me come in. That you would come into our hearts, you would come into our lives, and that you, you, would, you would feast with us and you would pour, you, you would ask the Father to give us your Holy Spirit, that same Spirit that is within you. And so it is with a, a recognition of this wondrous relationship of God with us, God coming into us to dwell in us, to empower us to turn to and follow the way of your righteousness. Lord, we know that that does not put us as privileged above all or anyone else. For all who have sinned may come before you. All who are struggling in the life of sin may enter into your presence. That because of the, the blood of Jesus Christ, you have justified us. You offer us forgiveness. And then you tell us, go and sin no more. Help to keep us on that path, O oh Lord, that we might truly be sons and daughters of God. Not just calling ourselves by the name of Christ, but walking in the way of Christ that we might truly be your light, the light of your presence in the world today. Draw others into your presence through the words that you give us and through the love that you put in our hearts. Allow us to see others as you see them. Let us love others as you love them. Work these wondrous miracles in our lives because it's it's difficult even for us to love our brothers and sisters in the faith. At times, it's 
difficult for us to love ourselves. And so we ask, O oh Lord, that you would use this time of worship to so order our lives as individuals and as a corporate body that we would serve to further your kingdom here at Spring Lake in our part of Fernando County, the state of Florida, and in this nation. Work through all who call ourselves by your name that we might affect the world that they too might live in your righteousness. I pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, our Savior. Amen. Amen. I'm reading this morning from John 8. Verses 1 through 12. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away, one at a time. The older ones first, until when Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. As our response to the Word of God, I invite you to turn in your bulletin to our affirmation of faith. This, this one comes from the book of Romans. <clears throat> Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? No. no. In, in all, all things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are, we are sure, sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing the hymn in the garden. I come to the garden.
this time as we receive our monetary offerings of gift to God as part of, part of all that he has given to us. We also are sharing our, get our prayer requests. And so you may please give those to the ushers as they pass the plate around. Pass those to the end of the aisle and just put it into their hands. <coughs> They bound the hand of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. They led him through the streets alone. They spat upon the Savior so pure and free from sin. They said, Crucify him, he's to blame. Upon his precious head, they placed a crown of thorns. They laughed and said, Behold the king. They struck him and they cursed him and mocked his holy name. All alone he suffered everything. When they nailed him to the cross, his mother stood nearby. He said, Woman, behold thy son. He cried, I thirst for water. But they gave him none to drink. Then the sinful work of man was done. To the howling mob he yielded. He did not for mercy cry. The cross of shame he took alone. And when he cried, it's finished, he gave himself to die. Salvation's wondrous plan was done. to the 
the hospital, she went back to the Grand to her apartment. Okay. So they're watching her. Okay. All right. So wasn't a hospital visit, but uh, the uh, the concern is for where she had had previous surgery, and so we'll keep her in our prayers. She's at the Grand. Um, please give her phone call, send her cards, uh, and let that uh, your reaching out be a blessing to her. Okay, and then uh, Sheila is asking for prayers for her sister Barbara and her sister-in-law. Um, I think that's Jan. And uh, Barbara has had some strokes and Jan is having problems with her hip. Then Linda Buffa um, is going to be having some hand surgery on Thursday and she's asking our prayers for uh, guidance for the doctors and for uh, the Lord to use the God-given healing process and even to provide miracles as needed. So, And then there's one more prayer request uh, for local government leaders. And uh, God does call us to be in prayer for our leaders, our religious leaders, our uh, civil leaders, and to be in prayer not uh, both for those that we really like what they're doing and for those that we really don't like what they're doing. Uh, and uh, that because our initial, our immediate desire needs to be that they would seek the will of God and uh, strive to do the will of God. And uh, so let's, let's go to our Father in prayer. Father, as we have lifted up these requests, uh, orally, out loud. We also lift up to you requests that are on our minds that, uh, that you, you can see what is in our minds and hear and know what is in our hearts and you minister to us, you minister to those for whom we pray. We also lift up our prayer that um, all, all of those who, for whom we are praying would seek not only your presence in their time of difficulty, but they would seek also your instruction that they might follow in your way. We thank you, Lord, for this gift of prayer. And we ask that you call us to prayer many times each day that we might be blessed in knowing your presence in such a wonderful way. We give you thanks in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. I invite you to join with me in the prayer that Jesus taught as, our, as a model for all of our prayers. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, now our medley of hymns. Okay. Robert, you remember the order, please. <laughs> Please stand. Eat. 
is I wait to hear what everybody else says. <laughs> and then, and right or wrong, we just follow along. <laughs> okay. Our next reading is from also from the eighth chapter of John, verses 12 through 30. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Pharisees challenged him. Here you are appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, Even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, for I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you have no idea where I come from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are true because I'm not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. Then they asked him, where is your father? You do not know me or my father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words by teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him because his hour had not come. Once more Jesus said to them, I'm going away and you will look for me, and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. This made the Jews ask, will he kill himself? Is that why he says, where I go, you cannot come? But he continued, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am he. You will indeed die in your sins. Who are you, they asked. Just what I have been telling you from the beginning, Jesus replied. I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is trustworthy, and what I have heard from him, I tell the world. They did not understand that he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Even as he spoke, many believed him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask this morning that your Holy Spirit will come and rest on Pastor Frank's shoulder as he opens the scripture to us so we can under, understand better what you have prepared for us to hear today. We thank you and give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Charlotte, I want to thank you for that prayer. Uh, I need all the help that I can get in order to present God's message in such a way that you'll be able to understand. And, uh, and I do appreciate that. I, from the day, well, even before I preached my first sermon, and in that ser first sermon and every time I preach in these more than 40 years, I, uh, I come with the Word of God in a very strong sense of my inadequacy. And I, I, I ask that God is the one who makes the sermon make sense for you. Um, I've told people a number of times if, because uh, I, I, I realized I had times that people would come to me and say, I'm sorry, I, I uh, kind of drifted off for a little while and was thinking about other things during your sermon. 
And, and I've, my response is that I hope that there are times that while I'm speaking and preaching to you that you drift off and you're hearing the voice of God talking to you about how this applies to you. And then you can drift back in. But that's what I really count on is that there will be some place in the message that it clicks for you. And I can only rely on God to do that. So. <clears throat> Where does light come from? Or maybe I might say, uh, uh, word it a little bit better to say, from where does light come? That sounds a little more sophisticated. From where does light come? Now, we might think the sun, or the sun and the star and the moons, uh, well, the sun and the stars, the, the moon reflects it. But where does light come from? Uh, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Now, how does that fit with science? And how does that fit with, well, what the Bible says? I've mentioned before that uh, God creates the sun and the moon and all of the stars of the heavens um, pretty far into the creation, pretty late in that week. He created light on the first day when he said, let there be light. And so light does not come from the stars. It doesn't come from reflection on the moon and, from, and uh, from even from our own sun. Light came from God saying, let there be light. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Now, you may have noticed that today we had two scripture readings from the New Testament. Usually I'll have one from the Old and one from the New, or as I uh, very faithfully would, would say it when I was doing chapels for our school, our church's school up in Jacksonville, because we had several uh, Jewish kids in our Methodist school, our Methodist day school, uh, which meant there were Jewish parents uh, that were there. And, I found it to be a great opportunity to emphasize every Wednesday when we had chapel, first for the preschoolers, and then for the lower elementary, and then the upper elementary, and then middle school, uh, that I would select passages from the Hebrew scriptures, and then I would select passages from the New Testament, the Christian scriptures. And I would remind them that, that Christians believe that the Hebrew scriptures, which we call the Old Testament, and uh, the Christian scriptures that we call the New Testament are both important. And those two passages would have a link from the Old and from the New. Sometimes it would be, I would be telling a story, and this is what we learned through David the shepherd, or David the king. And, and then I would say, and then this is what Jesus taught to his disciples, and it would be saying the same thing. So whether from the prophets or from the law, whether from the gospels or from the letters to the churches, uh, I, I would show that correlation that they're both together. <clears throat> While I was in seminary, one of our professors pointed out to us uh, a, a, I guess a response to the question of how is it that um, nations that had been Christian nations, like Germany, that had the church for so many years, and, and like Italy for a while, um, would turn and do such atro uh, atrocities that took place be leading into and during World War II. And uh, it was stated to us that historians recognized that the church had long stopped teaching from the Old Testament. And for a long time they had stopped teaching from the Old Testament and were focusing really only on the Gospels and, and writings from the New Testament. And, uh, and so it was easy to fool people about what was God's will when they didn't have that context. Well, today I'm preaching from two 
sections of the Gospel of John. But don't worry, next week I'll focus a little bit more on Old Testament. But at any rate, here we go. Um, the first reading was about an event that took place, a very personable event, where uh, while Jesus was speaking to everyone there in the temple courtyard, uh, and Jesus had been there the day before and, uh, and had gone and he came back and appeared in the temple courts early in the morning and sat down to teach and the people gathered around him. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, now it's worded that way, I recently came to a good explanation about that. But, uh, I have said before that a main difference between the Sadducees and the Pharisees were that the Pharisees did believe that there would be a resurrection of the dead, and the Sadducees did not believe that there would be a resurrection of the dead. And so when Christ was raised for the dead, from the dead, that they were sad, you see. <laughs> well, my, fav my favorite pastor and preacher taught me that, and so I can know that distinction. The Sadducees were sad, you see, because that Jesus proved that there would be a resurrection from the dead. Unless they had the same guy. <laughs> Unless they had the same guy. Yeah. I, I find that preachers like to pass on old jokes over and over and over. Again. Um, but at first, I didn't know it was a joke until everybody laughed. <laughs> but at any rate, um, but they're called the teachers of law. And something that I that I recently saw pointed out was that the Sadducees really focused entirely on the laws of Moses, and uh, the Pharisees uh, took as their authority the laws of Moses and uh, the writings of the prophets. Um, and so that makes a difference. So here we're saying, seeing the words that it was the, uh, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, both Sadducees and Pharisees, uh, brought to Jesus a woman who was caught in adultery. And they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such people women. Now, I think it's appropriate to point out um, it wasn't Moses commanding. It was the law that God had given. And it was God's, co it was God's command. But you see how um, so often bureaucrats will uh, quote others and, and uh, will take, take on the authority of other people uh, to, to boost their own authority. And often Jesus does point out that that's not from Moses, that's from God. And he'll also point out you're using that in the wrong way. But at any rate, uh, it's a little bit different way that he points out here. Uh, they say, uh, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, <clears throat> what do you say? You see, they were forming this question in order to try to trap him. And... Uh, And what we see taking place next is that, yes, God is the one who, uh, who determines what is sin, and God is the one who judges and brings about the punishment, punishment of sin or for sin. But Jesus is pointing out that God is also the one who can offer us a way out of our sin and a way for forgiveness of our sin. Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his fingers. A little bit later, they insist on a response, and he responds, and then gets, gets down and writes a little bit more on the ground. I would love to know what Jesus was writing. Yeah. I've heard some speculation. Well, he may have written this, he may have written that, he may have... And I thought, well, he may have written all kinds of things. Um, I mean, he could have even written in the sand, I love Frank. You know? <laughs> but um, I'll probably ask him when I get to heaven, what was it that you were writing? But what took place was he's just kind of messing around and, and not paying attention 
to their trap. And you'll remember he says, let any one of you, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw the stone at her. And he just goes back to doing something else. I think, I think it was just his way of saying, you know, you're, you're just not as important as you think you are. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to doodle for a little while. And uh, Jesus could have thrown the stone. He was the only one there that was without sin. He could have picked it up. I've, I've often pictured Jesus picking up the stone, but none of them would. Jesus picking up the stone and going, just dropping it to show that. But he didn't do that. I just picture it that way. And those who had come to cause trouble, it wasn't everybody who was there. Remember, Jesus is teaching, and people are captivated with him. And temporarily, the Sadducees and Pharisees take away that attention and distract but the majority of the people are still sitting there as these who are the accusers, those who had set the trap, one by one start leaving, starting with the oldest. I think the oldest were also the wisest. And so they more quickly got it. Yes, I've struggled with sin all my life. I mean, these are, these are teachers of the law. These are... Uh, teachers of the law and the prophets. These are those who are striving to know God's word and to disseminate that to the people of, of God. And we struggle with what to say and how to say it. And I, I'm confident they did too. <clears throat> we also struggle with thinking we know everything. And it's obvious that they did too. But... Um, starting with the oldest, and then it went down to every single one that had accused the woman who had brought her to set a trap for Jesus were gone. And Jesus said, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, sir. And so Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. You see, right there, Jesus was acknowledging that he could because he was the one without sin. He could have thrown the first stone. You see, he was God with us. And what this message is for us, it's not about the woman. And, and it's not really about me. It's not what... I get out of it, it's what I, uh, about me, it's what I get out of it about God. I just recently, I can't remember the source right now, but it was like within this week, I, I, I heard um, the point that the Hebrew scriptures, oh, okay, it was on Christian radio, that the Hebrew, the Hebrews um, mindset is, when they read the scriptures, they read the scriptures to, and say, what does this tell me about God? Um, the Western mind, that's us, when we, particularly in the United States, when we read the scriptures, we think about it from the perspective of, what does this tell me about me? And I thought, you know, that's, true. That, that's where I am most of the time. And then as I really study more, then it's like, oh, and it's telling me this about God. And it's, oh, it's telling me this about God. But Jesus was letting us know that it is, it is God who condemns. And then that reminded me, that reminded me that um, we are already on that path to condemnation. We are already condemned starting out. God doesn't need to condemn us. We are condemned. But God has, is working his plan, which we see throughout the whole, uh, the whole scripture, is doing his work to save us 
from the condemnation we are already in. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All need a Savior. So God's not out there just waiting for us to sin again in order to condemn us. We're already condemned, and God is constantly waiting there, like Jesus, doodling in the sand, ready to forgive us. And so what takes place here? Jesus could have thrown the stone. Instead, he forgave her past and offered her a new future. That's what we learn about God. God, throughout, we see that God is eager to forgive our sins and offer us a new future. How many times did the people of Israel turn against God, turn against God, turn against God, turn to other gods, turn to other ways? And God forgave and forgave and forgave, and then eventually, you're going to need an object lesson. And he gave Israel an object lesson, which is an object lesson for us as well. For us to understand God, even though he is eager to forgive, he is a just God. And he is a God who will bring about hardships in our lives for the purpose of helping us to be saved. Or maybe, hey, maybe you're on that path of righteousness and he allows hardships to happen in your life. Well, that's in order to help somebody else be saved. That little morsel is something that helped me to be able to understand that when Jesus said to give thanks in everything, even in the struggles, even in the catastrophes in our lives, it's because God's going to use it in some way, in some wonderful way, for anyone who would turn to him. It might be a catastrophe in my life and others see what God does in me and through me in spite of what happened. And so that helps to bring them to the Lord. Jesus could have thrown the first stone. Instead, he forgave her past and offered her a future. Because when he said to her, neither do I condemn you, he then said, go now and leave your life of sin. This isn't the first time, and it's not the last time. It's not just you are forgiven. Yoo-hoo! Go on living. You know? In fact, the left in our society, the leftists in our churches, will say that no one will be condemned. God is so much about love that everyone is going to be saved regardless Everyone is given forgiveness in the end, and everyone goes to heaven. All dogs go to heaven. Remember hearing about that movie? Um, every once in a while when we're having family conversations, my daughters will remind me that I didn't let them go see all dogs go to heaven. I should have gone to see it myself. I didn't want to see the movie. I thought it was going to be stupid. I've never seen it. But I, uh, I figured that it might give the impression that if all dogs go to heaven, all people go to heaven. But we don't all go to heaven. Truth is, <clears throat> theologically, John Wesley would have said, well, yeah, of course all the dogs are going to be, go to heaven. I'm going to see my horses, the ones that carried me all over England and, and then died, and then I got another one and died. I'm, they're going to be there. But you see, they're not struggling with this thing of sin. But we are. So the leftists say that no one will be condemned. All will be forgiven, regardless. But Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Now go and leave your sin, your life of sin. She and we are already on that path where we are condemned and until we are forgiven and leave our life of sin. Now, immediately after these events, we see it just jumps right into verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Leave your life of sin. Leave behind darkness. 
<clears throat> then Jesus goes on to say, I know where I came from and where I'm going, but you have no idea where I come from or where I'm going. You know what? Jesus had gotten himself out of that trap that they were setting, and he had shown everybody that they were way off the mark, and then he brings it up again on the next day, the next morning. He says, I stand with the Father who sent me. So Jesus is pointing out, yes, you don't know who I am, and you don't know where I'm going, but I know who I am. I know where I'm going. And it's the Father who sent me. So they say, where is your Father? See, they don't understand. They don't get it. They don't know what's going on with this. And Jesus tells them in verse 21, I am going away, and you will look for me, and you will die in your sin. You know, a lot of people will say that evangelical Christians are uncaring and uh, that we want to condemn everybody and we're not loving. But we see again and again that Jesus says things like this. You will look for me and you will die in your sin. You see, those who deny the way of God are remaining on the path of eternal death, separation from God. Jesus is helping uh, them to know and lets us know about God, that he, Jesus, is, carries the authority of the Almighty God. And he has, in that authority, the power to forgive us of our sins. And he will forgive you, and he will forgive you, and he will forgive you, and he will forgive you as you struggle. <clears throat> as long as you keep turning to him and asking for his help. And as long as you begin leaving behind your sin. Leaving it behind. Leave behind the life of sin. Jesus let them know what he saw in their hearts. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know what I am, that I am, and that I, let me say that again. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and who sent me, oh, that I, let's try a third time. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and, <clears throat> and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I am always, I always do what pleases Him. And even as Jesus spoke, many believed in Him. I'm going to have the closing hymn and then we have um, the uh, announcements here at the end um, our closing hymn is uh, Amen, Amen. Amen. Um, now I think we've kind of moved from some of us saying Amen and some of us saying Amen that's kind of like the argument of which, co which comes first the rice or the gumbo the gumbo or the rice <laughs> Um, but I like this idea, and maybe you'll do it with me. We'll start with all men and be kind of high church with all, all, all men. And then when we do it the second time, then we'll switch over to amen and be uh, country church. Yeah. All right. Let's go. Amen. Amen.
that's a Hebrew word, and I don't know how to pronounce it correctly. Um, either could be right, but I, I, I'm sure, please be seated, I'm sure that neither one of those are, are pronounced correctly for Hebrew. In fact, whenever I sound like I'm saying a Hebrew word from the scriptures, and I'm, and I'm saying it very well and polished, it's only because uh, I'm faking it by pronouncing it like you would the Greek. Um, I did have that class, and I passed it with adequate score to be allowed to graduate, uh, but I did not take Hebrew. So. Okay, so one announcement that I need to make, it was, uh, see, I'm, I'm glad that somebody's reading these ahead of time. It's pointed out to me that we, we need to make a correction on, uh, in April, right there, April 4th. Um, the cemetery cleanup is actually going to be April 8th and 9th. Is that right? Yes. yes. 8th and 9th. We're having it on two days, Friday and Saturday, so that for those that have a commitment already on one of the two days, you can still come out and enjoy that fellowship and that service. Um, and, and, and if we have both days off, you can come do it twice and get two free lunches because we're going to have hot dogs for both times and uh, hot dogs and fixings. Uh, yes, sir? I forgot to mention that on April the 8th, they're doing something to my neck okay. to relieve the pain. And so that's I won't gonna... be the pain in the neck anymore. Oh, you won't be the pain in the neck anymore, okay. Uh, so that might mean that you won't be uh, working with us on Friday and Saturday. So, uh, but you know what? If, if, you, if you pour some tea in the fellowship hall, then you can still have hot dogs because you would have helped. Okay. Um, there are other announcements listed here. I really like the way that it's listed, uh, by the way. Thank you. Uh, that my mind works this way. Everyone's minds are disorganized in different ways. Um, so, are there any other announcements? Um, well, let me put it this way. We do have an announcement about...